Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, ever popular review of the year brought to you by the Fox Williams Employment and Immigration Team. Uh, my name is Mark Watson, and I'm uh, chairing the seminar this morning. Um, it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Um, election, Brexit shenanigans, um, Trump tweeting from the White House, goading Rocket Man, Rocket Man firing an even bigger rocket, and the Russians doing what the Russians do best, just trying to destabilise everything. But life for you guys, HR professionals, um, goes on pretty much as normal. Employment tribunals, the courts don't stop making decisions. Uh, legislation still comes into force, even though our politics are a bit of a mess and the, uh, the world, possibly, is a bit of a mess. Um, nothing stands still in the HR world. Um, the purpose of today's seminar is to help you identify some of the key changes uh, that have come into play over the last 12 months in both employment and immigration, uh, and also to look forward uh, to what you might expect in 2018 and beyond. Now, um, I'm going to start off the seminar today with our, our part one of our canter through the cases, uh, looking at some whistleblowing cases, restrictive covenants, uh, and a little bit of holiday pay. Then Sasha Schoenfeld, who's our Head of in Immigration, will uh, look at developments in immigration law and practice looking forward again to uh, Brexit. After Sasha, uh, Joe Chatterton will uh, take you through part two of our case review. I think Joe's cases this year are going to be uh, discrimination with a smattering of ill health. And then we'll break for coffee about 10, just after 10. Um, and afterwards, uh, we'll don our best Mystic Meg outfits uh, and look forward into 2018. Um, Helen Farr is going to look at the um, general data pre protection regulation and what that means for HR professionals. There's less than six months to go before that comes into force. And then uh, Jane Mam, fresh from negotiating a settlement agreement at two o'clock this morning, um, will look forward uh, to other things that are going to come up in 2018, and we'll aim to close around about 11.20. Um, just before we push the button, a uh, few housekeeping points. If you could make sure your mobiles are on silent, that would be really helpful. Um, if the volume is a problem for you, if you can't hear at the back, then uh, just let us know. Uh, and also, uh, the temperature, if it's too hot, too cold, uh, we'll try and accommodate everyone. Okay, so... Um, I canter through the case as part one, and uh, those who are alert will recognise that legislation is not a case. Um, but I just wanted to flag for you um, a new offence that came into uh, effect or came into force at the end of September this year, and that's the Corporate Facilitation of Criminal Tax Evasion. And it uh, applies to UK tax and overseas tax. Uh, what it requires is um, the deliberate and dishonest conduct by an employee uh, that facilitates tax evasion. It's not enough if it's done accidentally. It's not enough uh, if the employee just doesn't know. Uh, it's not enough if he or she is negligent. It has to be deliberate and dishonest. An employer has a defence of uh, having reasonable prevention procedures in place. <coughs> And the reason for raising this is that um, it could conceivably cause problems for an employer that knowingly pays compensation or remuneration gross when it should be taxed. So someone who deliberately turns a blind eye to the proper tax treatment of a payment to an employee. Now, this is unlikely to be on the radar of the authorities. Uh, they've got bigger fish to fry. But, and there is a but there, it's probably advisable to ensure that um, those who are in that decision-making capacity within your organisations who are going to be involved in deciding how to uh, make payments, uh, whether to tax them or not, um, are aware of this and perhaps have had some suitable training. Okay, on to a couple of uh, whistleblowing cases. Um, Whistleblowing, just to summarise, um, a claim arises um, in, in the whistleblowing context if uh, a worker is dismissed 
or subjected to another detriment on the ground that is made a protected disclosure. And the subject matter of uh, that disclosure uh, can be that a criminal offence has been committed, health and safety has been compromised, uh, there's been a miscarriage of justice, and that there's been a breach of legal obligation to which the employer is subject. Now, the EAT, in a case that goes back to 2002 called Parkins and Sodexo, said that um, this concept of breach of legal obligation could include the breach of an obligation owed by an employer to the employee under his own contract, even though there was no public interest involved. Now, the government, um, moving at the speed of a rather slow snail, um, took 11 years to uh, change the legislation and in 2013 uh, added the provision which is highlighted on the slide uh, to uh, negate the effect of the Parkins case. So any disclosure had to be made in the public interest as well as tending to show uh, one of the uh, categories that I mentioned earlier. But what does made in the public interest mean? Well, uh, a case earlier this year um, gave some guidance on that phrase. It involved Chesterton's uh, estate agents and Mr. Nur Mohammed, who was a, a senior manager. Um, he made a number of complaints to the company about the manipulation of company accounts. Uh, and what he said was that the company was supplying information to um, its accounts team that overstated costs and liabilities, and that therefore reduced the profit on which his and around 100 other managers' commission was based. He was dismissed. Uh, he claimed unfair dismissal and whistleblowing detriment, and the Employment Tribunal, the Employment Appeals Tribunal, and the Court of Appeal upheld his claims. They said that his disclosure was in the public interest, even though it was an internal matter within Chesterton's, and his belief that it was in the public interest was reasonable. Now, what the Court of Appeal said was that there are no absolute rules in determining what is or is not in the public interest, but it did give a number of pointers. And first of all, it said that in the public interest can be satisfied by a group of employees, a small group, within an employer. There was no need for the wider public to be involved or interested in what was being uh, disclosed also said that the nature of the interests and the wrongdoing itself were relevant to the court's determination. So something that's important as opposed to something that's trivial. Something that's trivial won't be in the public interest. Something that's important uh, is likely to be. And something that's done deliberately rather than inadvertently would also likely be in the public interest. And the identity of the, whistle, uh, identity of the wrongdoer um, is also a relevant factor. Um, a larger, more prominent employer uh, is likely, more likely to be in the public interest for what it has done than uh, a smaller business. Now, this is cautiously, I suppose, uh, beneficial to whistleblowers. It, it, it shows that uh, they've got a margin of appreciation available to them as to what is or is not in the public interest. But the Court of Appeal did make it very clear that Parliament clearly intended that private disputes between employer and employee would not qualify for the public interest um, uh, uh, disclosure. Uh, and that remains the case notwithstanding this decision. The second whistleblowing case um, involves international petroleum and Ozipov, and it's a bit of a, a salutary tale for individuals who dismiss a worker uh, because of a protected disclosure. Um, Ozipov was the CEO of International Petroleum. He made uh, four protected disclosures concerning aspects of the uh, oil and gas exploration business that International Petroleum ran in Central Africa. His unfair dismissal claim succeeded. He was held to have been automatically unfair dismiss, un unfairly dismissed because the sole uh, principal reason for the dismissal was the fact he'd made protected disclosures. But, and this is the interesting part of the case, 
He also claimed against um, the majority shareholder in um, International Petroleum, who also happened to be a non-executive director, and the majority shareholder's right-hand man, who was also a non-executive director. The shareholder decided that Ozipov had to be dismissed, and the right-hand man implemented that decision. And his claim against these individuals succeeded, and that resulted in the individuals themselves being personally, jointly and severally liable with the company for the losses that were awarded to Ozipov. Now, some commentators have said that this case may not survive scrutiny by the Court of Appeal if it gets there, uh, but at the moment it's good law. And I think the takeaway for employers in this situation is, is probably, probably twofold. Um, one is check that you've got insurance cover that covers your decision makers who may be involved in this type of dismissal, and also probably train them to make sure that, so far as it's possible, you avoid um, them being put into this situation where they may be personally liable. Because what clearly is going to happen, as has happened for, for many years in discrimination claims, employees will claim against the company and, where they're, they're able to do it, claim against the individuals who make decisions that affect them. Next case uh, in, involves a lawyer, Mr. Rawlinson. Um, he, he was general counsel of an insurance company. Um, there were performance issues with him, but Brightside wanted to try and ensure that in getting rid of him, they had um, a, an orderly handover. So they told a little lie. Um, they said to Mr. Rawlinson, uh, we're actually outsourcing our legal function. Um, uh, hand over your, your, your work. Um, but you're leaving our employment. Now, Rawlinson, being a fairly bright lawyer, said, well, hang on, that's Tupi. Um, can you tell me the identity of the transferee? There not being a Tupi transfer, Brightside couldn't do that. Um, Rawlinson walked out uh, and said, I've been constructively dismissed. Uh, he didn't walk out because of the lie, because at the time he didn't know it was a lie. Now... He didn't have any unfair dismissal rights, so he claimed for breach of the Tupi regs, uh, and also he claimed constructive dismissal on the back of that. The important part of the decision is that the um, Employment Appeals Tribunal said that the lie was actually a breach of the implied term of trust and confidence that um, the employer owed to him, and that that lie, that breach, preceded and stood apart from his dismissal and that enabled him to make recovery of his unpaid notice monies. And what the case really highlights is that um, if an employee suffers loss as a result of a breach of the implied term in steps leading up to his dismissal, then a separate claim arises independently of any claim for unfair dismissal. And normally, there wouldn't be any loss in that sort of situation. Rawlinson is perhaps a, an exceptional um, case. But other examples, um, and the ones that crop up in the cases, are where there's been perhaps um, psychiatric damage suffered by an employee uh, and consequent loss suffered by the employee as a result of that breach of the implied term uh, leading up to the dismissal. Not the dismissal itself, but leading up to the dismissal. So uh, the moral of the story, I think, is um, uh, honesty does pay in this situation. Um, don't tell a white lie. Don't tell a lie when you're dismissing someone, whatever your reasons, because that can come back to haunt you. Restrictive covenants. Um, the next case, uh, Tillman and Egon Zender, is uh, it's an important court of appeal decision which could open the door to uh, successful challenges by employees um, uh, against the restrictive covenants in their contracts. Um, Mrs. Tillman was the co-head of the financial services group at Egon Zender, which is a, uh, an executive search company. Um, it, it formed about 22% of their global billings. She'd had various promotions, um, uh, but hadn't had a new contract on e each of those promotions. She resigned. Um, Egon Zender 
paid her in lieu of notice, and she then said, I'm going to join Russell Reynolds, which is a, a major competitor of Egon Zender. Now, in her contract was a, a, a covenant for six months. It was a non-compete covenant, which said that she must not, directly or indirectly, engage or be concerned or interested in a business that competed with Egon Zender. Um, Egon Zender, quite concerned about her going to Russell Reynolds, and decided that it was going to enforce the covenant. Now, uh, the Court of Appeal um, uh, made a decision which essentially said that covenant is unenforceable. And there are two important reasons for that. First of all, it said that it was unreasonably, the language in the contract was unreasonably wide. The language around being concerned or interested in a competing business could have prevented Mrs Tillman owning shares in a competing business. She had no intention of owning shares in a competing business, but the mere possibility that that would be caught by the covenant rendered it unenforceable. OK, Egon Zender said, um, uh, fine, if that's what you, you, you think caught. Um, you have the uh, ability, the inherent ability, to sever, to cross out um, parts of the covenant which uh, render it unenforceable and therefore uh, please cross out, be concerned or interested in so that we're left with uh, a covenant not to engage in a competing business. And that would probably have been enforceable. What the Court of Appeal said, no, we can't do that. Um, this is a single covenant. Uh, it stands or falls in its entirety. We can't delete part of the covenant. It is no business of the courts to create a valid restrictive covenant to replace one that is impermissibly wide that's been drafted by the employer. There is talk of appeal on the um, uh, severance point, but I'm not sure that that uh, will actually fly. I think the lessons here for, for, for employers are probably threefold. First of all, keep covenants under review. Um, secondly, if you're drafting covenants, then ensure that you include a shareholding carve-out. If Egon Zender had had that in their contracts, then uh, this covenant would have been enforceable. And also, um, think about drafting your covenants as um, separate covenants, not single standalone covenants. And by that, um, I mean what's on the slide. Um, the top example, um, I think, would have been um, uh, determined by the, by the court to be a single standalone covenant. And if you are, um, if, for example, the non-compete element falls away, then you would lose the whole suite of covenants. Whereas the rather unwieldy drafting down at the bottom creates three separate covenants. If you lose one, you don't lose the other. And that may be, pending any appeal on this point, may be uh, a sensible approach for employers to take. I just wanted to flag very quickly um, a, a trend in the enforcement of data protection legislation against employees who take employers' data. Um, there's an offence in the Data Protection Act, which is uh, uh, an offence of obtaining and selling personal data unlawfully. Uh, the consequences are a fine, costs, but also a criminal record for the offending employees. And there are four examples on the slide of things that um, uh, happened and which were the subject of criminal prosecutions against former employees in the last year. All of these individuals prosecuted successfully by the ICO, uh, and it is more inclined to prosecute these days um, than in recent years. The fines were not huge. They ranged in these examples from £200 to £7,500. But the individual ended up with a criminal record in each case. And in one example, you'll see there was a civil liability um, that, that followed on from that. The individual had to pay compensation in that case of uh, over £400,000 for um, uh, the, the uh, data that he had stolen from his employer. So I think if, if you're um, uh, in, in, a, in a business where uh, personal data is uh, important, uh, 
then it may be worth thinking about flagging this um, legislation uh, and the potential uh, of a criminal uh, offence and criminal prosecution, uh, perhaps in handbooks, uh, perhaps in resignation acceptance letters, and almost certainly in any data protection training that um, you undertake with a view to dissuading employees from um, stealing your data. And then finally, uh, with, with my case review, uh, a, a last minute addition, if you like. This was a case that was um, reported only at the end of last week and many of the ramifications are still being worked through. Um, but it involved Mr King, who was uh, categorised as self-employed. Uh, he was happy. Uh, his uh, engaging company was happy. Uh, they offered him an employment contract. He declined. Everyone was perfectly happy about the situation. Um, his contract didn't provide for holiday pay or holiday. Um, he did take some during the uh, period he was engaged by the company, but it was unpaid. Um, things turned sour. He put in a claim for holiday pay, and uh, the case went all the way through to the European Court. The outcome was that he was held to have been a worker throughout his period of engagement with the company. He'd been wrongly categorised um, by the uh, company, and the consequence <coughs> of him being a worker was that he was entitled to four weeks paid holiday each year. And there were two um, important consequences of the, the, the decision. Um, firstly, um, you, you, you may recall that the working time regulations provide that untaken leave, untaken holiday, is lost at the end of the leave year. So you take it or you lose it. There are exceptions. Maternity is one. Um, holiday accruing during ill health is another. But generally the principle is holiday pay is lost. And what the European Court said in this situation was that um, the untaken holiday that Mr King was claiming was not lost at the end of the year because he had not actually been granted the holiday to which he was entitled. And that to, to that extent, the working time regulations are incompatible with the EU directive. And the second element here is that this left open the possibility that Mr King, if he had been engaged since 1996, may have a claim going back to 1996 for his four weeks holiday that he was entitled to in each year. So um, that's quite an expensive um, prospect for engaging companies um, if they've miscategorised individuals as um, self-employed rather than workers. And there are two further points just to make on, on King. When, when we were at peak holiday pay case um, level um, a few years ago, um, you may recall the government limited the uh, look-back period, the period that individuals could claim for underpayment of holiday pay. Um, and they limited it to two years. So if your holiday pay um, didn't contain an element of commission, uh, of overtime, you could only look back for that two-year period. And in the Bear Scotland case, which was one of the key cases uh, on holiday pay, um, the, the, one of the outcomes of that case was that if there was a three-month gap between instances of underpayment of holiday pay, then that would break the series of deductions and therefore make it more difficult for claims to be made. And some of the early commentators on this King case um, have said that both the two-year look-back period and the three-month break decision were incompatible with what the European Court uh, decided in this case. Um, I, I just wanted to say this is not necessarily the case. So if you see all of this in some of the commentary, it's not necessarily the case that um, these two principles, the two years and the three-month break, um, are uh, incompatible with this decision. This is a decision about holiday pay which was not granted. It's not a decision about an underpayment of holiday pay. That's a distinction um, that I think needs to be made here. Um, there's a long way to go on the case, um, but uh, watch this space for developments on the back of that. Thank you.